and welcome to Interludes with Chris McKenzie. And we well, welcome back John Lanchbury, conductor and composer. We're very happy to have you back in Golden Days Radio. And Chris, it's lovely to be back. We're going to talk today, I think, about Don Quixote. Is that right? That's absolutely right, yes. Don Quixote, or Don Quixote, as some people call it. Not really the sort of idea one would have thought of for a romantic ballet. So to make it a romantic ballet, which is what they wanted to do in the 19th century, they had to put in a pair of young lovers. <laughs> and we're going to hear, first of all, uh, the young lady who is a young lady of Barcelona and very beautiful and wayward she is. <laughs> That was about the wayward lady from Barcelona? Yes, it certainly <laughs> was. Uh, but, of course, she needs a young lover. Oh. Now, the point about this young lover is, of course, it's the, it's the young male principal dancer of the ballet. The thing about this version of Don Quixote is that this version was put on by someone who, at the time when he put it on, was the greatest living male dancer and this is Rudolf Nureyev. Ah, Nureyev right. had learnt this ballet in Russia, where of course he was brought up, and he wanted to put on his own special version. And I was very honoured and thrilled and a little frightened uh, when he asked me if I would do the musical arrangement for him. So he was more or less living in London then, working a lot with the Royal Ballet, of which I was the principal conductor, and he proposed that I should like to arrange the music for his production of this ballet. So I invited him to my house. I took the precaution of having a, a quantity of whiskey laid in because I'd heard, and sure enough, in the business of an afternoon and an early evening, he managed to put away two thirds of a bottle and I just about got through the other third, <laughs> but we did get through half the ballet. Good. And it was absolutely, and we did the same thing the next day. So in two days, we'd done the whole ballet. And it was absolutely marvelous because he had an old Russian piano copy and I had to sit at the piano. He knew I was a bad pianist. He didn't, no, never you mind, you play through, play like, it doesn't matter, you hear. So I 
blundered through it and he would say things like oh I love this number we must have this one oh no this one stinks no we don't want this <laughs> oh uh, now I want something like this but better write something in same tempo but much better tune and I always remember on one occasion he said that silly minkus here is one of best tunes he writes and all he did is write it once make a nice repeat please Jack <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this was the way we worked but it was absolutely wonderful to work like this and I got a great insight into his the way he wanted to do this difficult job difficult but very rewarding job of taking a comic ballet and making sure it had enough marvelous dancing in it enough of the best of the music there was and in fact a lot of the music is pretty damn good and it certainly makes you want to dance. I always remember a lady in the audience at Covent Garden stopping me afterwards at the, at the stage door and said, you didn't mind that that critic wrote and said that the music wasn't very good, did you? I said, no, I don't mind. I said, I enjoy conducting it and I think we all enjoy playing it. She said, but everyone loves to dance to it. She said, we're all dancing in the audience. Where our feet are tapping, it's so wonderful. And this man, this strange man, Minkus, he did have an incredible gift of writing music that made everyone want to dance. Uh, he was born in Vienna and you can tell that very soon because tune after tune after tune is a wonderful waltz. He turned out the most marvellous waltzes and they just make everyone want to dance. Anyway, that was the young lady who came in and we now see her boyfriend who um, does a very short pas de deux with her to a cello solo. Well, of course, that's her partner jumping in and dancing with her, with the castanet. Anyway, something goes wrong because a fight breaks out in the street and the old Don, we have to see him because the ballet is called Don Quixote, the old Don comes in.
that's more than enough of that. Anyway, a little while later, uh, after some girls have come in and done a gallop, then it's time that we saw the two principals, and we're going to hear this on track nine, do a lovely big number, which of course, since it's by Minkus, is a wonderful waltz. <laughs> Okay, now of course it's time that the Corps de Ballet had something. So they have a very wonderful Spanish dance called a Paso Doble, which is a double step. So much for the Paso Doble, but while all this dancing has been going on, there's been some story happening as well, because uh, the Don, of course, has fallen head over he heels in love with the girl, whose name, by the way, is Keetri, if I haven't mentioned that already, and is determined to woo her and win her. He sees her rather like the heroine of the book he's been reading, but also we've had a funny character, a silly rich man who lives in the village and is madly in love with her and also wants to marry her. So the young barber and his girlfriend, our hero and heroine, decide to run away and leave the village. Uh, he has just stolen a purse belonging to 
his girlfriend's father and they think while well, they've got that money they're going to run away so they run away but they are in hot pursuit by those other people and they actually uh, run away up to a big plain where there are lots of windmills and where gypsies are dancing. I chose that one for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a great favourite of mine. And secondly, it's a wonderful example of the way Rudy actually gave me my head. He let me, let me do what I thought was best. Uh, I adore Spanish music. I have to tell you that this came along at a time, this job, not long before the summer holidays and I had planned anyway to go to Spain for my summer holidays. I've been mad about Spain since the year dot and I took a, a lot of this with me and did a great deal of the scoring in Spain and I like to think that in some way some of it sort of rubbed off onto the score. But anyway, be that as it may, I indulge in all my best fantasies about Spanish music and I, I have a lot of time for good quality high quality second rate Spanish music and I think I've chosen my words wisely. <laughs> I think you know exactly what I mean. And Rudolph never minded at all. Um, he had very few comments to make. There was one uh, number of his, he was very worried about it because it wasn't very good choreography. It's also terrible music but it was the only thing that we had that fitted and he said to me, uh, have you orchestrated my variation yet? And I said no, not yet. Why? He said sell it sell it we've got to sell it bush it up make it strong make it strong sell it so I sold it that's exactly what I did <laughs> I made it as strong as I possibly could the only other thing was I always remember he was standing on the stage looking down at me in the pit it, I th it was the first stage in orchestra rehearsal I think and we came to a scene where I put in a few nice little twiddly bits you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The woodwind were playing dilidum, dilidum, and I put in an extra dilidum, and he broke off what he was saying to a dancer and looked down at me and said, Oh, Jack, you are camp. <laughs> 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 I always remember that. And then went on with the correction he was giving the dancer. Yes, there was another moment, I may say, because this was done in Vienna. This was done for the States Opera Ballet in Vienna, this, this production in 1966, November. And in Vienna, there is a scheme whereby dancers, if they've been in the company for so many years, and I think it's five years, and they've kept their noses clean, can never be sacked. You imagine what a two-edged sword that Ooh. is, that situation. They cannot be sacked. And of course, because of this, laziness creeps in. And you've got this whole middle echelon of dancers who are too old, to have any real ambition, too young uh, to be to be to, to to leave, they can't be sacked because of the regulations. So they're dead weight. They're really dead weight. And I'm afraid there's a whole chunk of them that sometimes do. Uh, forgive me, Vienna, if this sounds very rude, but there are some of them who seem to do as little as they possibly can and get away with it. Now Rudy knew all about the the the, uh, the system whereby after so many years they have a pension and cannot be sacked. And there was one particular rehearsal where there was one particular boy who was just not caring a tinker's cuss about what he was doing. He couldn't have cared less. He was using, oh dear me, using no energy whatsoever. Rudy suddenly clapped his hands and said, stop! in that, tum, 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 uh, that tone of voice where everybody knew this was unmistakable and everyone watched him and said, what was he going to say? And he said to the boy, you, coming here, come up here. 
and Rudy sat at a desk where, near where I was sitting there, and he tore out of a notebook a piece of paper, scribbled something on it as if he was writing something, gave it to the book and said, gave it to the boy and said, "Here, here is your pension." Oh! <laughs> there was a moment's silence, and then the penny dropped. It, the boy went absolutely scarlet. He sculped back into his place. And if anyone worked in that room for the rest of the day, he did. <laughs> and, you know, in spite of behaving like that, people adored Rudolph because he was Rudolph at all times. He, had, he was quick to anger, very quick to forgive. And he expected this from other people as well. He didn't always get it. And, of course, everyone so many people at least were jealous of the fact that he was earning this enormous amount of money which he was he was getting so grossly overpaid because he was he was a big star he was star material there's a wonderful story about a, another ballet that he put on la payadere and a boy who was one of the principals in the royal ballet danced the a very difficult part of it of, of the role which rudolph had created for them uh, actually danced it better than Rudolph and Rudolph was watching from the wings one night while this boy Michael Coleman was dancing this variation and Michael came off the stage perspiring having danced this absolutely brilliant solo and Rudy said Michael you take bread out of my mouth <laughs> uh, oh but that was that was him mm. and he was just from that level and many other levels as well he was adorable and he was wonderful to work with because as i say he gave me my head uh, he let me he, if i if he he thought that the orchestration was fine he let me do it he he had very little criticism to make he, he had very little criticism to make of my conducting i'm very glad to say and he also took points he took advice as well and not every dancer will do that and he was wonderful to work with. However, we're getting well away from that, that story. Here we are on the plains in the middle of Spain, where I believe the, the rain mainly falls, and we are threatened by giant windmills. What number did I say we were up number to? Number 16. Number 16. Now, something else has happened here, which is that a puppet master has come along, and he's got a, um, an old wagon, and he has a number of puppets who do... One of them looks rather like the silly man that wanted to marry Keetri. One of them looks rather like a version of, of the beautiful young Keetri, our, our leading lady. Another one looks rather like Nureyev as the young dancer. And these puppets move to a strange sort of unreal life, and here they are. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, we're working our way through the story, but I'm afraid we have to stop now because we have more music than we have time for. But as you heard, the windmills were set going and the dear old Don, he did his best to fight the windmills with the aid of a wind machine in the orchestra. However, everything ends happily, of course. The barber marries the girl. The Don walks off into the sunset thinking that he's in love with his magic mystery dream girl forevermore and the silly ones get their comeuppance. <laughs> listening to John Lanchbury tell the story of Don Quixote and stories of Rudolf Noreev as well. John, thank you very much for coming into the radio. As always, I have loved talking to you. It's thank been, you. been wonderful and thank you very much. We hope to see you again. I hope so too. <laughs>